This is CBN News Watch. Thanks for joining us for CBN News Watch. I'm Wendy Griffith. We begin this half hour in the Middle East. New intelligence has emerged revealing how much the IDF has damaged Hamas's military capabilities. As Chris Mitchell reports from Jerusalem, this information comes as both Israelis and Americans remember the horrors of 9-11. Intelligence base, Israel's defense minister Yoav Gallant shared a document from a top Hamas commander, written in May before he was killed in an airstrike in July. The letter to Hamas leader Yahya Sinwar and his brother reveals the severity of the losses the IDF has inflicted on Hamas. That commander, Rafa Salami, seen on the right in this photo, wrote, We have lost at least 50% of our fighters. As for weapons, he wrote, we have lost 90 to 95 percent of our rocket capabilities, and we have lost some 60 percent of our personal weapons. Yuav Gallant stated the net result is that Hamas as a military formation no longer exists. The defense minister also spoke of a particularly disturbing photo the IDF found in Gaza. I would like to show you what we find recently in tunnels in Khan Yunus. That's a picture. These are the kids of Muhammad Sinwa posing against the evil event of September 11. This picture shows what we have been fighting since October 7. ISIS, Al-Qaeda, and Hamas, they are all the same. The Israeli military is still hunting down Hamas terrorists one by one. And with Hamas so beaten down in Gaza, Media reports suggest it's ready to accept an immediate ceasefire based on President Biden's plan from July, but only if there are no new conditions from any side. At Israel's 9-11 memorial on Wednesday, Israelis and Americans came together to remember the fateful day 23 years ago. It's the only memorial outside the United States with all the names of the nearly 3,000 who died then. It's particularly emotional after what Israel experienced, the world experienced on October 7th. On September 11th, 2001, I was three months pregnant um, with this baby right here. Jewish commentator Hillel Fould sees a profound connection between 9-11 and October 7th and the bond between Israel and America. And unfortunately, that bond uh, has only become stronger over the past 11 months when we experienced our own 9-11. And on the one hand, you feel like this day is so special, maybe we should just not make that comparison, but you can't not make that comparison, primarily because it's the same people who per perpetrated it, and it's the, 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 the global plague of radical Islam. Fould says this threat is worldwide. The global community has to wake up and understand that it's the same people who did what they did back then are the same people who did October 7th here in Israel. The forces of good have to put an end to terror. It's enough. How many more of these ceremonies do we need to go? We have 365 days a year. Now two of them are marked by September 11th, October 7th. Let's make sure that no other days are going to be marking terror. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Thanks, Chris. Back here at home, parts of the country are battling heavy rain, wind, and the risk of tornadoes as what was Hurricane Francine makes its way inland. Schools and businesses are closed in areas of South Louisiana as residents there begin cleaning up the damage after Francine passed through coming ashore Wednesday evening. Lori Johnson has more. The powerful storm made landfall near Morgan City, Louisiana, as a Category 2 hurricane after gaining strength from the warm waters of the Gulf of Mexico. She packed winds of 100 miles an hour, downing trees and power lines, cutting off electricity to more than 400,000 customers. Flood watches were issued. The storm surge pushed a wall of water over roads and submerged cars. Many locals have survived hurricanes before, but it never gets easy. It's overwhelmed, scared. Even though you've been through storms mm -hmm. before? I still feel the same way every time a storm comes. Residents banded together as a community to fill sandbags to protect property. Evacuation orders went out to people in Cameron Parish. Louisiana's governor warned those who chose to ride out the storm to take cover. Now is the time that we're going to stay off of the roadways, stay home 
and stay put. This convenience store boarded up windows but promised to stay open to help people in his community who needed gas. We're the only uh, place out here for the sheriff's department, the fire department. We have gas. Uh, all the locals depend on us. Not too much worried about it, but you never don't think it changes. Some especially low-lying areas of New Orleans are dealing with flooding, but overall the new pump system that keeps water out of the city did its job. Louisiana activated more than 2,000 National Guard troops. Meanwhile, President Biden approved a disaster declaration for the state of Louisiana. Lori Johnson, CBN News. Thanks, Lori. Economic issues took top billing in Tuesday's presidential debate. Now new numbers give insight to the actual state of U.S. inflation. The latest consumer price index shows it is at its lowest since February of 2021. According to the Labor Department, the CPI rose 0.2 percent in August, bringing the year-over-year -year inflation rate down to 2.5 percent. That's the lowest the country has seen in more than three years. Well, the impact of inflation on Americans' bank accounts is extending to churches. New data shows giving did not keep pace over the past year, and on top of that, church attendance is down. As CBN's Jenna Browder reports, potential solutions offer hope that churches can turn this trend around. From the grocery checkout line to the gas pump and now the church pew, Americans are closely watching what they spend and it's putting some churches in a bind. Churches are in some instances are struggling, right? That they're not keeping up with inflation. Uh, donations are down. Some instances, uh, attendance is down. Robert Blair with Ministry Brands works specifically on helping churches grow donations. The group's latest study shows 2023 giving failed to keep up with inflation, with 55% of churches seeing a decrease in giving. This hits smaller churches the hardest, with only 36% reporting an increase. On top of that, cash and check donations dropped for a third of all churches surveyed or in the study. But there are some things churches can do. Blair says it starts with church leaders communicating well. One of the most important things is the conversation that the pastor or the leaders of the church have with the congregation. Talking about giving, why it's important, and candidly, what's it for? What's the money going to? He says being transparent with congregants about where their money is going can lead them to give greater amounts and more often. Another plus can come from offering a variety of ways to give, like going digital. I have a 21-year-old son. He's never going to write a check, ever. Right? My mom only writes checks. So as leaders in the church and as leaders of trying to grow healthy churches, we need to be able to accommodate all congregants. I can tell you that digital giving has been a catalyst to um, our ability to increase our giving across the board. We're reading from the New American Standard Bible today. Pastor Solomon Adair leads Inspired to Live Church in Arlington, Texas. Giving for us uh, throughout these uh, COVID years and these inflation years has actually gone up for us. We've grown, um, but that's due to our heavy evangelism focus. Um, we're always inviting somebody to church, sharing the gospel. It's a part of the culture. That plays into their goal of asking more people to help do a lot by everybody doing a little. The church is now in the process of buying and renovating its own building. We see him as a leader in the way he works with his congregation and talking about donations and talking about digital. Blair points to Pastor Adair's approach as a model to follow. Communicate well, offer many ways to give, and be bold. The Bible says we have not because we ask not. And one way to ask is to make it easier for the ask. Jenna Browder, CBN News. Amen. Great advice. Thanks, Jenna. Coming up, last year alone, Southern Baptist reported 241,000 fewer members and nearly 300 fewer churches. We sit down with Clint Presley, the new president of the Southern Baptist Convention, who talks about his vision for the future. Stay with us. You're watching CBN Newswatch. Welcome back to CBN Newswatch. Last year, the Southern Baptist denomination reported 241,000 fewer members 
and 292 fewer churches. The new president of the Southern Baptist Convention is leading the effort to reverse this decline. CBN's Charlene Aaron sat down with Clint Presley to talk about his vision for the future. The mission is the gospel, leading people to Christ, pointing people to the life-giving love of God found in Jesus. What you see is we actually do. A priority Clint Presley is known for as pastor of Charlotte's Hickory Grove Baptist Church, a multiracial church that draws some 3,000 people each Sunday. CBN News got an up-close look at Presley, known for traditional three-piece suits in the pulpit and posting his workouts on Instagram. Keeps your muscles moving, keeps your joints in good shape, gets your good bone density. Makes you strong. Presley will need strength to steady the nation's largest Protestant denomination, something he believes God has prepared him for. I have been a Southern Baptist pastor uh, since I was 23, so 32 years now, and been involved in Southern Baptist Convention, really at all levels, served all kinds of churches. I think all of that prepares you for the role. He's also faced trials. After Presley and Connie, his wife of 32 years, struggled to conceive, the couple adopted two boys, brothers Nate and Mac. We didn't intend to adopt two. Uh, we got on an adoption list, and uh, we got a call that there were two children in a legal risk adoption. We trusted that the Lord had done this, brought this to us, and so we agreed to do that. And my oldest son uh, was 18 months no, 20 months, and my youngest was six months. Then last year, tragedy struck. 24-year-old Nate, who had been estranged from the family, died of a drug overdose. Presley admits trusting God through grief hasn't been easy. You cling to the promises of God. You know, we all like a smiling, happy providence. Things are good. God uses that as well. But then he uses the hard providence to take you into a valley that you have to trust. Pastor Presley comes to the presidency as Southern Baptists also navigate a variety of challenging issues, such as responding to sexual abuse, women in ministry, and the steep drop in SBC membership. Last year, the denomination reported 241,000 fewer members and 292 fewer churches. To hopefully turn things around, Presley wants to get back to basics. We've not done a really good job in the last several years making sure our focus is not just on the things we want to stand against, but what are we for? The, the gospel, what does it do? And how do we share it? And the good news for people that we really do think God saves people. And so we would do well to have our attention turned back to those things we actually do a good job at. In order to begin that turnaround, he will face questions about decisions by Southern Baptist delegates that have made headlines. That includes their approval of a resolution regarding in vitro fertilization, affirming that embryos are human beings from the moment of fertilization, whether in the womb or generated in a lab. A resolution is no action. You don't do anything. It is say, we recognize this and resolve. And the resolution was to take the logic of pro-life so we're against abortion. We think life begins at conception. Taking that logic and then extending it further uh, to what do we do with the embryos? It really was a resolution to challenge people to think another step beyond. It, it wasn't a ban on IVF. It wasn't saying if you're using IVF, that is wrong. We, we weren't saying that. We were saying we need to be careful how we think of these things. If we actually are pro-life, then we need to extend that logic into every arena of life, including in vitro fertilization. We also discussed the subject of women pastors within the SBC. Delegates voted down a measure to formally ban churches with women pastors. Within the Baptist Faith and Message, our statement of faith, it is a statement that uh, while women have all number of roles in a church, provide great leadership, the Bible teaches as strictly biblical people, the office of pastor is reserved for a man. Another lingering topic deals with sexual abuse reform. Two years ago, the SBC formed a group responsible for creating resources and building a database of abusive pastors. The task force ended its work in June with still no database. While Presley is not sure if or when it will happen, 
He hopes local congregations take the lead. We want to make sure and equip our people, pastors and leaders of the churches where they are, to make sure that they are training their volunteers and that they are taking care of victims at the local level in the church, because that's where it happens. And that's where people will be healed. That's where um, survivors will be ministered to. Meanwhile, as the 2024 presidential election nears, Presley chooses not to get too involved, hoping instead to lend his voice to matters of eternal importance. That's what God called me to do, is to be a pastor and a preacher. That's what I do, is uh, spend my time studying the Bible. And then when Sunday comes, uh, take the Bible, teach the Bible as the Word of God that is food for our people's soul to uh, point them to our King Jesus. I'm not saying that people shouldn't vote. We should uh, and exercise that right. But that's not where our hope is. Charlene Aaron, CBN News, Charlotte, North Carolina. Welcome back to CBN News Watch. After this week's presidential debate, many American voters are still pondering which set of policies to embrace former President Donald Trump's or those of Kamala Harris. Appearing on this week's episode of The Global Lane, Timothy Plan President Art Ally contends God's policies are the best for the country and we should not underestimate his plan for America. I know who's in charge of all this. And it's not Washington, D.C. It's not any capital of any state. It's not the political. We are in a war for the soul of America and the wars between good and evil, like it always has been. Um, and, you know, ultimately, we win and they lose. Uh, and that's what I liked about Ronald Reagan when he said, how do you think all this is going to come out? Well, it's easy. We win. Uh, we win because God is in control. Not me, not the president, not anybody. But that doesn't mean that while we're here, we shouldn't engage. We are commanded to occupy. But, uh, you know, I know who's in charge. And, you know, uh, you may not know this, but my wife uh, went to heaven a year and a half ago. And she used to get so frustrated as she hated liars and deceivers and all of the stuff from the evil side. But if I could hear her voice from heaven now, I know exactly what she'd say. She'd say, you know what? None of that really matters. Do the best you can while you're here, but ultimately you can't stay here. We're going there. But that doesn't relieve us of the responsibility to engage. And, you know, we're pretty doggone active in that, uh, the role, but God is in control, not man. Well, as most Americans engage, they agree that prices need to come down. Mass immigration must be addressed. However, there's great division over the abortion issue. In this November, voters in 10 states will be asked to codify abortions in their uh, constitutions. So how can we ever come together on that politically divisive issue? Uh, I don't think that's going to happen, Gary. Uh, you know, how in the world can you argue about killing babies? You know, you use terms, you use abortion, you use uh, choice, you use all of these terms. But bottom line, you're killing babies. And the side that, uh, you know, is supporting that, it, there's good and there's evil. And, you know, they're, they're just on the evil side. Uh, I don't know that that's ever going to be resolved. I don't know that it ever has been resolved in the history of mankind. But, uh, you know, the disappointment I have, and, you know, you have to make choices. Most catastrophic events like 9-11 unite us as a people. The nation seems pretty uh, polarized right time. now. Yeah, well, I was yeah. going to say we seem pretty polarized right now over many issues and the country's direction. So what must happen for us to be united again and not only temporarily? Well, I think, you know, what we really need is a great awakening, Gary. Uh, people need to come to grips with the fact that God is in control. And that's starting to happen. Uh, I don't know if you reported on what happened at my alma mater, Ohio, the Ohio State University. The? Where, where a, a revival broke out uh, on the university campus, led by the football players who are the heroes and people will follow what they do. Baptisms occurred. Uh, if that could spread, and I think the only hindrance to that is the big problem we have in America is in the church. All these problems lie at the doorstep of the church. God's church has 
diluted uh, his principles, and his principles only work, Gary, every time. Um, so until the church shows a little more gumption and awake and committed to God's ways, until that happens, I don't know that there can be a great awakening. I don't know that there can. I, it's not up to me. It's up to him. Uh, but I'm seeing glimmers of hope. The pendulum is starting to swing back. America is still a country that is dominated by people who have basic moral Christian biblical values. The problem is all of us on that side have been very quiet and sitting back and allowing you know, the other side to run rampant and to totally destroy the biblical and cultural and moral foundations of this land. Okay. And when you brought up abortion, you know, why would we be arguing about killing babies? I mean, that that is so fundamentally wrong. Okay. Art Alley, Timothy Plan President. Thank you, Art, for sharing your thoughts with us today. We appreciate it. God bless you. Hey, Gary. Thank you. God bless you. Great interview, thanks. Coming up, a cuddly baby walrus is happy to be alive thanks to a team of heroes. We share the good news next. Your news channel, your shows, the stories you care about. Anytime you want, anywhere you want. Download the CBN News app today. Well, this baby walrus got a second chance at life thanks to a team of heroes. Savannah, an animal care specialist at the Alaska Sea Life Center, received a call back in July that the walrus was by herself on the beach. The walrus came into the Sea Life Center malnourished, dehydrated, and infected with wounds to her face. Now, six weeks later, she's doing well thanks to the team's 24-7 care. The animal specialist says the plan is to work with the Alaska Native community to pick out a fitting name for her. Well, that's going to do it for this edition of CBN Newswatch. Remember, you can find more of our news programs on the CBN News Channel anytime or online with CBNNews.com. Also, tell us what you think about the stories you've seen today. You can email us at newswatch at CBN.com or reach out on Facebook, Instagram, or X, formerly known as Twitter. God bless you. Have a great day.